switch talks. Um, our next uh, speaker is Laurie Driesilber. Um, Laurie uh, is a graduate. She received her PhD from the University of Buffalo. She's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Population and Human Genetics in the laboratory of Dr. Jen Doherty. Um, she is a representative, a representative of our T program. And just um, reminding you, since we were chatting over to the side, repeat the questions um, so that we can all get them. Hi everyone, thank you for your attention and for your attendance today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one of my ongoing projects in the lab of Dr. Jen Doherty. I am looking at lung cancer and specifically features related to DNA methylation in a certain subset of heavy smokers. So I am epidemiologist by training. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about lung cancer epidemiology for those of you who may not know. So, lung cancer is the second leading cause of cancer in both men and women in the U.S., and it's also the leading cause of cancer death in both the U.S. and worldwide by far, as you can see by these um, percentages, we were about a quarter of all cancer deaths um, in men and women are due to lung cancer, so it's a very deadly disease. It's important, one of the most important features of lung cancer is the histotype, and so this is important for treatment, it is important for, um, it's important for prognosis, um, it's aging, everything. So these are based on um, pathologic features um, that can be assessed in a biopsy or in a tumor sample. And um, just really, and this is a very big overview, and the most common, I would say, that you would see in the literature is generally um, non small cell lung cancer, and that's because over 80% of lung cancers end up being that histotype. However, adenal carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma do make up a very large proportion of that, so those are usually um, the subcapes that you'll see occasionally. Some studies they get small cell lung cancer because it does uh, act pretty differently from the um, non small cell types, although we took those at, um, at their different disease course as well. Uh, one feature that I want to point out that I'm sure all of you are aware of is that most lung cancer is attributable to smoking, and most lung cancer deaths are also attributable to cigarette smoking. However, only 10 to 20 percent of lung lifetime smokers will develop lung cancer, and so there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to understand who's going to be developing cancer, who is, um, rather than some other co comorbidity, or just not be affected by it. Additionally, um, adenocarcinoma in particular is a type of lung cancer that is found often in um, subgroups that don't have this high prevalence of lung cancer, such as non-smokers and women. And so that subtype is also known to have various um, various genetic mutations that can be clinically actionable, uh, but have their own downfalls, as um, we've seen with the monoclonal antibodies um, and recurrence in those individuals. So although cigarette smoking is very important um, as a risk factor, there there is other there are other things that are going on. <coughs> so I told you that I was going to talk to you about methylation today, but really I'm going to talk to you about one facet of methylation that um, one of my collaborators has worked on very extensively. And so um, this is named methylation-derived neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. It is a mouthful. Um, I'll be referring to it as MDNLR, but it will be written on the slides. And so what I show down here uh, in the lower left corner is just like a, um, a sample, say like a petri dish of um, somebody's blood sample. And what is shown is the different white blood cell proportions. Um, an important feature of these is that you can take the neutrophil count and um, take the ratio of that with the lymphocyte count. And this is a measure of systemic inflammation that is thought to um, represent the DNA to the adaptive immune response. And so the complete blood count, um, this is just some, this is a general measure that's done clinically all the time. And 
Um, a lot of the literature on this in particular is retrospective because um, when patients will come to the clinic, they get uh, blood work done, and this is just one of the features that's commonly performed. And so there's a lot of data on this, um, but how, how we can use it in different ways um, is still beginning to be explored. One problem with neutrophil to lipid site ratio, though, is especially in uh, the field of epidemiology where we have cohort studies where we collect blood in the score. Um, stored blood you, has, you cannot measure reliably complete blood count in stored blood due to the viability of the cells. So uh, my collaborator at Kansas, um, Dr. Devin Kessler, has worked on deconvolution algorithms to, to estimate cell type proportions from based on DNA methylation data. And so we DNA methylation is just this methyl group. Um, I don't know. Well, anyways, um, the in the blue, the CH3, that's a methyl group added um, to this particular locus. And um, the site that it's added to is called uh, a cytosine phosphate guanine dinucleotide. And so that's a CPG site in methylation data. And what we can do, because DNA methylation can, or it does control gene expression, that means that it also um, controls cell differentiation mechanisms. And so what we can do sorry, <clears throat> is take, take the genome-wide DNA methylation data that we have and then use the deconvolution algorithms to specify what we would predict the proportions of each of these white blood cells to be in a sample of blood that has been stored where we couldn't actually get the, um, the physical measure of the neutrophil to lipocyte ratio. Um, okay. So there's a large literature on this, and I don't expect you to be able to read any of this at all. This is just to remind you to talk about it. So uh, there's a large literature on on mortality and NLR in general. So this is regular neutrophil to lipid ratio from complete blood, blood cell counts. And this is uh, this is including lung cancer. So for specifically, a lot of this research has been done um, in different different subsets of individuals where this sort of information has been available for so clinical trials. So you'll see that um, there are specific treatments that are associated in most of these titles. And another feature of it is that because it is uh, a measure that is taken when a patient is uh, coming in to seek care, we can get pre-treatment neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, but that is also likely reflecting a disease process that has taken over, especially in the case of lung cancer, where your whole biologic system goes awry. Um, and so the NLR that's reflected by pre-treatment um, is going to be different than your, just say, regular systemic level of inflammation that would have happened before you had lung cancer. And so on the contrary, um, there are several studies that have looked at risk and um, NLR, and in particular in lung cancer, there have not been a lot. So prior to um, the publication of the, one of the studies I'm going to talk about today, there was only one other study, and it looked at um, a group of individuals who, who were under a certain screening protocol. And so it was, it's also a very specific population, but as an epidemiologist also, that's part of what we do, and um, it, is, it is meaningful to look at this the specific groups of individuals, but also you need to look at a lot of specific groups of individuals in order to get a full picture. And so um, NLR, so the broad idea here is that NLR and lung cancer, there, there's a limited literature for risk. Um, the, it has an important, it could be important for lung cancer screening. And I say this because if we can, if we can use NLR to indicate who is um, about who's more likely to have lung cancer, we can reduce the really high false positive rate that is associated with um, lung cancer screening right now. Um, the, the task force has recommendations, but even with these pretty strict recommendations, like 30 pack year history of smoking is a lot. So um, if we could find other indicators, 
figures, um, and even within the group of people who are eligible, um, better be able to understand who will go on so that we can really do the screening in the correct group. And then because the methylation derived MLR is a newer topic, this is not the most general literature. And then for mortality, there's an interesting question about pre-diagnosis. So as I was saying before, the pre-diagnosis measure um, in different cancers, actually, in, in different conditions, such as uh, alcohol. So pre-diagnosis alcohol use uh, in gastric cancer can predict mortality outcomes, for instance. Or you can think of, say, BMI and colorectal cancer. Um, there are lots of examples of it. So these measures of, of something that is a characteristic of a person prior to diagnosis can predict their uh, outcomes from the particular cancer. So that's what I was interested in um, for the study I'm going to tell you about. So the population that I'm looking at is for the CARES study, which you might have heard of. It was a randomized controlled um, trial of beta carotene and retinal palmitate. And um, it was canceled because it, it was it was obviously the hypothesis was that this would improve um, like improve or sorry reduce the risk of lung cancer in these kind of smokers. However, it ended up instead of having the anti-inflammatory effects that were suspected, um, the lung cancer incidence had increased, so the trial was canceled. However. We have data on these individuals, including blood draw, uh, prior, about four years prior to diagnosis. And so, have a little bit of the, um, of the characteristics that were required for enrollment. You'll see that it is oh, 20 or more factors of um, smoking is what is considered heavy smoking. And so, that's even still less than the requirements for the screening process. But it, um, many of the individuals who participated in the study were would have been eligible if screening was available in the early 90s. So um, within the CARES study, I was, I've been looking at a domestic case control study that was selected in 2005. So the, I have a timeline on the next slide, but these were the, um, being that it was a domestic case control study, there were several matching factors that were taken into consideration um, as any good epidemiologists would want to do so that it can increase the power of the future studies. And so, oops. so the, this is just an idea of the timeline. Um, there was a blood collection time point, and then there was follow-up through 2005 where lung cancer diagnoses were matched to controls who had at least as much time at risk. So it's not saying that all the controls did not develop lung cancer but they at least had to have the same time at risk as the cases. And then um, that was what was considered the active follow-up period. Then through 2015, there was a, uh, a, a passive follow-up period where we looked at the linkages with uh, the National Death Index and state registries. And so the blood was drawn about four years before diagnosis, and in that stored blood, we ran the alumina epic um, DNA methylation assay, and that's 850,000 CPG sites, so there's a lot of data available. And that data was fortunately normalized and pre-processed by one of my colleagues, and so I can just do all sorts of things with this data now. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the two at the top, um, the two at the bottom, the epigenome-wide association study and methylation signatures, those are going to be part of my future TL number. But um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we found already. So for uh, lung cancer risk, the question is, among individuals at high risk for developing lung cancer, can we identify those who will be cases prior to di diagnosis or during early disease? And so the timeline will be relevant in this, in the not shaded area. And so the green X is indicating a case, and then the purple hourglass is indicating what a maybe a matched control would have been. Um, because this was a matched design, we used conditional logistic regression modeling, um, standard adjustment variables, and we looked by histotype and overall. Just real briefly, these are the results we found. Uh, we did find statistically significant 20% increase of 
lung cancer for each unit increase in MDNLR for all lung cancer cases, and then when we restricted only non-small cell, we found a 30% increase rate. <coughs> we did not see an association with um, small cell lung cancer, which is the third one down the green. And then we did a few subgroup analyses just based on what we had to see if there could be any interaction. And we did see that there was a little bit of a stronger association for some, um, some rather than others, but really the take home here was that screening um, there might be some usefulness of, uh, MD or of NLR or MDNLR in lung cancer risk and potentially uh, for that screening modality in that publication of the bottom. So then for mortality, this is a little bit newer of a study, and again, this is going back to the idea of what your profile is before your diagnosis, if that can predict what your outcome will be after your diagnosis. So, to put that on the timeline, the black X will be a death, and then the um, orange hourglass will just be a person who got diagnosed with lung cancer and then just was censored at the end of all of because they had not yet died. And um, this is going to be a time to event analysis among cases, lung cancer cases that were diagnosed in 2005 only. And then again, because this is MDNLR, the blood collection is the exposure time point. So there's um, that was happening prior to diagnosis for all these cases. Um, so, right, so we did Cox proportional hazards modeling, again by histotype. This time we looked at quartile um, levels of MPNLR, and um, it, these are actually four sections. So if you just look at the top section, that is all three quartiles comparing to the lowest quartile of MPNLR, which would mean uh, low levels of inflammation which is good, and then the fourth quartile would be high levels of inflammation, which is not so good. And um, we see that the most significant association was in adenocarcinoma. So the ordering here is the three uh, hazards ratios for lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, squamous, and small cells. So among adenocarcinoma only, there, that was where we saw the linear association. <coughs> Oh, I don't know what happened to the colors here. Um, but that is, these are the subgroup analyses for um, MDLR and lung cancer mortality. And the important take home here was that the features were all related to um, shorter period of smoking, younger age of life, younger age of diagnosis, and then also the active intervention arm, um, which isn't all that surprising since it increased inflammation. So, um, that is what I want to talk to you today about. These are the people that I like to acknowledge and that I work with, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, I have two questions. One is, does NLR predict relapse? So in patients who apparently respond, you have those several studies there. Mm -hmm. is, does the change in NLR change at the time of primary, you know, initial diagnosis, and does it predict relapse? That's number one. The second question is: Is there any relationship of NLR to the presence or absence of the PD1 or the measurable presence or absence of PD1? Since again, there were a couple of studies. Yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. So the there is a literature that says that the pre-treatment, so not the pre-diagnosis that I'm looking at here, but that the pre-treatment um, NLR is associated with, um, with poor progression, well, increase is associated with poor progression pre survival. Uh, in our study, we didn't have information on recurrence, so we only used that as our outcome. As far as PD-1 in, um, or PDL one it is associated because both of them, um, it, like for those of you who don't know, that that's the inflammatory um, target of much of the now um, standard of care immunotherapy for lung cancer. And so we are planning to look at features of that in the future, but um, I have not done any of that work yet. Thank you. Yes? So, if I remember correctly, you certain outcomes only during the year Yes. Yeah, so Yep, so the, the year that lung cancer was diagnosed for everyone um, was 2005 for this particular study, yes. 
So why in today's novel do we need to talk in five? So um, she's asking about the, uh, the anybody who developed lung cancer between 2005 and 2013, and we do have information on who developed lung cancer, but um, 22 of the 319 controls that we have, they did develop lung cancer, but we didn't have information available for stage on those people because it was a passive follow-up, and in a survival analysis, that's a very important feature, and so we weren't able to include them in that study. Um, 